All right, let's head over to the Zoom line here. Look at that. I got my flannel on. I threw a flannel on. I'm here in the uh, Midwest where it's uh, pretty chilly here today. It's below freezing. We didn't get any snow, but uh, dip below freezing up here in the Midwest. Warren Martin, you're down in Kansas. What's the weather like down there? Have you started the propane stove yet? Well, I'm done. I'm telling you right now, I, I decided a long time ago, being a New Mexican desert boy growing up, uh, when I started moving and changing for jobs, I got up here to Kansas and realized that about an hour north of me is where they have gates on the interstate, where they close the gates on the interstate for snowstorms. And I decided that that was my extent. I'm not going any further north. If you have gates that close the roads because of winter weather, it's too far north for me. So we have been mild. Uh, we've been in the 60s, and we'll be in the 60s most of this week. And so it's been a it's been a good week for us. Not to top your story or anything along those lines, but uh, your your kind of your uh, benchmark or your kind of your um, yardstick, if you will, for your tolerance of the snow reminds me of. Uh, back in it was 2016, I want to say, I did a story for the Bismarck Tribune on the Bakken oil field. It was the sixth coldest winter on record in the state of North Dakota. And it was so cold that the uh, diesel trucks were gelling up on the interstate. And, of course, the heavy machinery was just, it caused some problems out in the Bakken, right? Well, we had... I want to say it was a hundred days consecutive below zero degrees that winter. And somebody called me on like, I, it was one day where it peaked up above like 20 degrees. And a friend of mine called me and he said, Jason, it's so nice out. Let's go ice fishing. And I thought, boy, that's the most messed up comment I've ever heard in my life. It is so nice out. Let's go stand on a frozen lake. Okay, let's go do that. So that became kind of my, I got to get out of here. This is not for sane people up here in these parts of the world. And yeah. uh, uh, so anyway, cold weather. And uh, you're from the New Mexico desert. Which part of New Mexico? So from eastern New Mexico, I'm from the great metropolis of Texaco, New Mexico. Sure. Uh, Right on the state line between Texas and New Mexico, thus its name, Texaco. Um, and uh, it, it is a very arid climate. We did get cold weather, but generally not more, not for more than a day or two. It blew in, blew out, and it was gone. We were still up on the high plains, but uh, there was no trees, no land formations that stopped the wind. And so fronts would blow in, they'd blow out. And so it was very quick. Uh, so I'm not I'm not keen to these uh, you know ten day plus is below zero. I'm not keen on that. Speaking of the wind blowing any which way and growing up on borders, I grew up on the North Dakota Minnesota border. You grew up on the New Mexico Texas border, so we have very similar backgrounds uh, when it comes to politics in terms of what we grew up around. Grew up around mm -hmm. a lot of red, a lot of blue. A lot of industry, a lot of ag, a lot of energy, a lot of these different things. Um, what was your takeaway from the election, the recent uh, Donald Trump? As uh, as far as I know, I haven't heard too much outside of the election night that he won. So I assume he's still the winner. But uh, what's your takeaway from the election? Yeah, I think it's interesting. First of all, when I grew up in New Mexico, it was not a red, it was not a blue state. Um, when I grew really? up in Mexico, is much more of a red state at that point in time. It has since gone uh, pretty drastically to the blue side. Um, and it's kind of this last election made a little bit of moderation back towards red. Uh, it, so, you know, it, it, I grew up I grew up with a lot of different ideas. I grew up on Native American reservations, worked on seven reservations before I graduated high school, uh, mm -hmm. seven summers in a row working on Native American reservations. And uh, my grandma lived in Albuquerque. I worked in Taos. I worked in Santa Fe. And so I've, I've kind of seen all those different elements coming together. But for me, on election night, it was a great election night. Uh, one, I went to bed at 1030. 
uh, I went to bed at 10.30 that night because I knew Trump had won at 10.30 yeah. that night. And they didn't announce it till about, what was it, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but I knew he had won at 10.30 because they kept going to the swing states looking at uh, some of the districts and all the districts they were looking at. He was increasing his margins among women. He was increasing his margins among minorities. And that was the Democratic stronghold. They had to hold those. And so I knew once he was increasing his margins among the women and among the minorities, and he already had the numbers at 1030, I knew he had won. Um, and to me, that for the industry, that's a great thing, especially for the industry here in Kansas. That's a great thing. I think the election will have major ramifications, maybe not on any other industry more than the oil and gas industry, because the oil and gas industry is the economic driver that drives inflation up or drives inflation down. Um, if you have access to cheap, reliable energy, inflation goes down. If you don't, inflation goes up. If you want to go back and look at how we got into this inflation mess in the beginning, go back and just look at the headlines of the stories that were leading up to where we are today. When we went into uh, started going into this inflationary period uh, back in 2020, uh, following the pandemic, and we started moving into this inflationary period, for about 18 months, every story that you heard out there was about the escalating cost of energy. Uh, from every perspective you can possibly imagine, they were looking at the escalating cost of energy. Then about 18 months into the inflationary period, the stories began to change and no one longer was anyone talking about energy. They were talking about the cost of milk and eggs and uh, produce at the grocery store and those types of things. And the reason before that is, is energy drives inflation uh, or energy reduces inflation depending on what the cost of energy is at that point in time. Because when you increase the cost of energy, when you increase the cost of how much it costs to feed the cattle, how much it costs to gather the feed for the cattle, how much it costs to gather the cattle, how much it costs to milk the cattle, how much it costs to keep the milk on, on it cooled, how much it costs to pasteurize the milk, how much it costs to transport the milk, and on and on and on. How much it costs for the bucket that the milk is in, whether it's a plastic gallon or it's a wax carton. Both of them are made by petroleum. And if the cost of energy goes up, the cost of those things go up. And so at the end, by adding just fractions of pennies along every step of that way, you increase inflation. And the more you increase energy, the more you increase inflation. And that's why I think the election was good for the industry as a whole, but especially for Kansas. It was good for the industry and for the country as a whole, because Donald Trump has said over and over again, that um, uh, that that uh, recalling and pulling back uh, regulations, what he calls deregulation. Deregulation, as he has said, is the economic driver of the economy. And that is true. A lot of our inflationary costs that have been contributed, especially in the energy market, which impacts every other market out there, a lot of those costs have come through increased regulation. And in my opinion, many times, over-regulation. We do need regulations in our industry. We'll be the first ones to admit our industry needs to be regulated. We don't want bad actors in our industry. But there's a difference between regulating an industry and over-regulating an industry that artificially inflates the energy cost. And that's what is what happening. And I think that the, we have a little bit of a reprieve coming in with Donald Trump coming in, uh, maybe rolling back some of those regulations, especially here in Kansas. Kansas, as we've talked about many times on this show, is a marginal well state. We produce on average two and a half barrels of oil per well. Uh, you know, we're not North Dakota. We're not Texas. We're not some of uh, uh, Colorado or California. Um, we don't have those major wells that are producing 20,000 barrels a day, 10,000 barrels a day. Our average well produces two and a half barrels a day. So our operators work on an extremely small margin. And probably one of the biggest issues that we have to consider, one of the biggest issues that we have to look at going forward into 2025 is how the methane emissions regulations are going to be implemented. That was a law that was passed with the Inflation Reduction Act. It is a law that's been signed by the president. It is a law in place. The only way to overturn that is to go back to Congress and pass a new law, which is very 
unlikely to take place. But what is a bright light of hope for Kansas, because if that law was fully implemented to its nth degree, it could put as many as 80, as much as 80% of the wells in Kansas out of business, plug those wells because they would not be able to produce the margins to be able to keep, keep them economically feasible. But it all comes down to how is that law going to be administered? How is it going to be executed? And so the executive branch was key for the Kansas oil and gas industry, whether you had Kamala Harris that was going to execute those laws or whether you had Donald Trump that's going to execute those laws. That's a very different picture of the extent to which those laws will be executed and to the fullest extent of them. So it's a little bit of a light of hope, not the end of the battle, but the beginning. Uh, but it's a beginning that shows a little glimmer of hope that uh, potentially we can move forward and uh, continue to have all of those wells, if not all of them, the vast majority of those wells continue in operation, because that's vital for the American people. Somebody asked me the other day what I thought about, you know, the oil and gas industry, and they were talking about cryptocurrency and artificial intelligence, and we segued into the uh, energy industry. And I said, boy, I tell you what, if I was a believer of cryptocurrency and I was a believer in artificial intelligence, I'd be buying natural gas stocks all day long right now. Because from my understanding, the amount of energy that it takes to run a crypto currency operation at least the ones in north dakota are astronomical and the ones that tesla has tried to do and a number of different things and you know it sounds like a broken record a lot of times by saying natural gas is the only reliable source of energy but now it's actually becoming serious that's why you see people like elon musk come out and say we we can't get off oil and gas and i think even bill gates has even said that once or twice to where a lot of these different people that were somewhat against fossil fuels are coming out and saying, well, we need it. Well, when you take a look at their backgrounds, a lot of it has to do with technology and a lot of technology needs a lot of power. Where, where do you see cryptocurrency? Where do you see artificial intelligence? And do you agree that um, you know natural gas would be a really good buy right now, I guess? With all the regulation talk you just got done talking about, you know. Yeah, I think I think any of the fossil fuel industries would be a good buy at this point in time. And uh, part of it's what you're talking about right there, but a big part of it's just the natural flow of things. Uh, the IEA, the International Energy Administration, they came out and they said that by now, between now and 2050, we're going to have to add 28 percent of energy to the the current annual production. Uh, 28 percent. Over a quarter, what what we produce right now, we're going to have to add one quarter, 28% more to that in order to be able to meet the demands of the country going forward. And that's because you have 60% of the population of the world that is energy deprived, 40% of the population of the world, approximately on all of these, 40% of the population of the world that still depends on firewood for the heating of their homes, cooking of their meals, 20% of the population of the world that survives on less energy every single year than it takes to run the refrigerator in your home. And they all want more energy. Add to that, between now and 2050, it's predicted we're going to add about 1.7 billion, billion with a B, billion people to the planet. The more people you have, the more energy you're going to have. So the International Energy Administration came out with this study that showed that between now and 2050, we're going to have to add 28% of energy production per year by the year 2050. So there's a real question of how in the world are we going to do that? What's really intriguing is, is that that report did not consider, it considered cryptocurrency, but it did not consider the addition of AI. That's kind of been more of a recent development. And we're seeing what the energy uh, suction that AI is taking on from that. And so that 28% is going to do nothing but expand. 
And so if you are in the opinion that we're fixing to transition, we're fixing to move in and out of one energy form into another energy form, then you are not looking at the information because every single source of energy on earth is growing and every single source of energy on earth needs to continue to grow. That's the only way we're going to be able to meet that demand is if all energy sources continue to grow. The vast majority of them, over 80% of the energy in the world is produced by uh, fossil fuels. So I think right now, an investment in fossil fuels long term over the next 10, 20 years is a good bet. Because unless governments come in and legislate us out of business, there is a great future for fossil fuels. Let's talk about that. You mentioned one of the things to keep an eye on is some of these methane regulations that are happening. And some of these regulations that can really impact the the small business operator, the independent operator that just doesn't have the staff to either keep up with the paperwork, to to fight the lobbyist fight, to even fight sometimes even the way that the uh, uh, money gets shifted through the different subsidies and grants and 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 incentives, etc. When I take a look at <clears throat> where we're going and what, where we've just been, there are some pretty serious uh, regulations that, you know, you've mentioned, but we're coming off of a very big kind of a, a surplus or a stimulus with a lot of these orphan wells. And as, as great as that's been for the industry, when you, you know, when you cap a well, it doesn't produce anymore. So a lot of companies that were maybe, doing business on a productive well are now doing business on a well that's not going to produce. So what happens then? I think there's going to be some companies out there that are going to be looking for some business. And if they're not handing out leases and there's uncertainty in the marketplace because of regulation, uh, we we could have a little bit of a problem until some things get ironed out. What, what, what do you think of that? Where on one hand, if the IRA money is running out and companies now need another project, and if there's no leases or there's a problem getting leases due to regulations, there might be a little bit of a hiccup there. What what, what do you make of that timing, if you will? Yeah, I think that I think that that is an issue that the oil industry has dealt with for the past 30 years uh in increasing measure. I think it's a continuing uh, conversation that needs to be had. I think that's a, another win for us, uh, for the industry as a whole with Trump coming in, because that should free up a little bit of uh, opportunity to access government lands, to uh, uh, speed up the permitting process and those types of things. I think, again, the biggest thing right now is is the, the uh, Methane Emissions Reduction Act, which is geared towards reducing methane emissions where it, if it was implemented to the fullest effect, will require that every single well, every single pipeline, every single transmission line, every single tank battery, uh, everywhere there's a connection where oil or natural gas are connected from one place to another, there would have to be monitoring equipment that would be engaged in that proximity to be able to uh, identify how much methane is being emitted from those sites. We have study after study showing that marginal wells have nominal to no methane emissions. Uh, yet the cost of that equipment to monitor for methane is, is outrageous. And the ability for the state, which the federal government has placed all of this on the states, to monitor these well sites, what they call facilities, and a facility can be one well uh, and so or one pipeline. It can be just one element that's on your property. And with the states, the states don't really want it. The states, because it's it's unfunded. There's no way to, uh, to uh, collect monies to be able to do the monitoring that is being required by the law. So what that means is, to whatever extent it is employed, the states are going to have to put in a funding mechanism to be able to fund monitoring the methane emissions on these sites. And that is our biggest danger that is moving forward. You have 80% of the producers in the United States that are independent, small producers 
they only produce 20% of the oil in the United States. But 20% is a significant amount. The other 20% of producers, which are the majors, produce 80% of the oil. And so really what we're in right now is when you look at the industry as a whole, we're in pretty good shape. When you look at the smaller independent oil and gas industry, it really comes down to how the executive branch employs that law that was passed under the Biden administration and puts it into place because there are going to be oil companies that are going to go out of business when it is implemented. There are going to be wells that go out of service when it is implemented. And the real question comes into what extent. And so it's not just about how much more can we expand to keep our production going and keep our production up to speed, but how much are we going to lose that we're going to have to make up for? And that's a real issue for us going forward in 2025. Is this, are, are these some of the topics you talk about when you go out and do your events? I mean, um, we should mention you do about 250 plus events a year. You get out in front of all sizes of crowds. And um, do you, like, you've been on four or five events in the past week and past 10 days. Is this stuff that you talk about there? It depends on the event. Well, we do, uh, we actually do about 200, uh, uh, 200 plus uh, events a year that I do face to face meetings with people. And um, it depends on the group that I'm meeting with. These, you know, this means nothing to a third grader. Uh, it means nothing to right. a middle school student. And so we make them age appropriate, we make them content appropriate for the group that we're meeting with. But when we start meeting with citizens that are parts of Rotary Club, Lions Club, Kiwanis Club, those types of things, we want them to have a better understanding of how the decisions that they're making uh, when they go into that ballot box, how the decisions they're making impact their own lives. And I think that that is a big disconnect that is existing in the United States at this point, where we think that if we go in and we stick it to the oil companies, we stick it to the fossil fuel companies out there, then that doesn't hurt me. That doesn't impact me. But it does impact you. Just like I was talking earlier about the inflation and how inflation that begins with the energy market and transfers through every single other industry out there, the decisions you make to try and stick it to the oil industry or stick it to the fossil fuel industry, eventually that sticks it to your, your wallet. It sticks it to your pocketbook and impacts you in the wallet. And so, you know, that's those are conversations we have with our more mature audiences that are able to little, uh, comprehend and understand a little better um, what we're talking about. So what events have you been on lately and which ones have you got scheduled here over the next um you know, week or two or month or whatever, just uh, talk about some of the diversity of the crowds and, um, um, you know, some of the more recent ones. You did the customer appreciation one last month. That one looked fantastic. The photographs and the social media picture. Yeah. Describe that once again. That was cool. Yeah, we had a great event, uh, Garnett, uh, Oak, or excuse me, Garnett, Kansas. Uh, we had about a hundred, a little over a hundred people that came out for our industry appreciation. It was our second one that we've done. Uh, first one we had about 120. It was in Northwest Kansas. This one was in Southeast Kansas. We're hoping as we go forward to do about four of these a year uh, going forward. It's basically a way for us to um, reach out to the pumpers, the, the field hands, uh, the people that are out running the rigs and the ones that are, you know, that are out there. Well, uh, for years, we've gone to industry events. We've gone to the Cuyogas, the Ecogas. We've gone to all of the uh, local industry events. We've talked to the producers. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find a producer that didn't know who Kansas Strong was. But what we started realizing is that the people that are working out in the field really had no idea who we are. Um, And because the producers knew they were satisfied with what we were doing, they never passed that down to their team. They never passed that down to the people that are out in the field. So this was an effort for us to try and reach out to those people in the field and help them understand why they should be proud of the job that they're doing, how their job impacts American families and keeps America on the right track, and uh, help them understand how to share more effectively their job with their own community. Because the reality is, is when you're talking about energy, when you're talking about energy, and a lot of times, energy versus the environment. 
And it shouldn't be that way. It should be energy and the environment. It should be an and in there instead of versus. But unfortunately, many times it's energy versus the environment. On the environmental side, you have a pretty staunch grassroots movement uh, that has permeated our society uh, to every level of society, and you know, in addition to what the media does and what education does, it really has permeated the entire society. The only way that we can combat that, the only way that we can have a meaningful conversation in the public, is if everybody in the industry becomes an advocate for the industry. That's where we begin to turn the ship, is when we understand what we do matters, it changes people's lives, it protects the lives of people, and it moves our country forward, and we should be proud of that. And when everybody in our industry understands that, then they're able to go out and advocate for our industry, and that's when we begin to see the ship turning. Um, and, and the only other way that the ship turns is if we go the legislative route, and eventually if we just go purely the legislative route, we will be legislated out of business, and America will wake up the next day and say, oh, man, we didn't mean that for that to happen uh, because we'll be in the same position Germany was when Russia invaded Ukraine and the energy was cut off from Germany. And they woke up and they realized we switched everything to wind and solar. And they woke up and they said, we didn't mean for that to happen. Um, and that's the position that we're in right now. And the only way to do that is if we permeate our communities where we're having open conversations, not talking points, not commercials, not bullet points, but actual conversations where people develop an understanding of our industry. And that's what those events are all about, helping our own industry have a better understanding of what they're doing, how they're doing it, and how it's impacting the world. Uh, so that they can be advocates for our industry. And that's been really great. From there, we've gone to schools. I've uh, uh, gone, done presentations all the way down to third grade, all the way up to the collegiate level uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, and then we've also done tons of social groups where, uh, you know, Lions, Kiwanis, Rotaries. Uh, now we're kind of moving into a season where it's more of uh, the holiday festivities and so most organizations are doing kind of holiday type things. We got three, we got probably four or five uh, events coming up that are uh, purely oil and gas presentations. Uh, the rest of our events through the end of the year are more industry focused for Christmas and Thanksgiving and holiday events. And we'll use those opportunities as a way to kind of speak to the choir and help them have a little bit better understanding, maybe help them uh, figure out how to communicate a little better to the people that are in their own communities. One of the ways that I've mentioned in the past that <clears throat> I felt the oil and gas industry dropped the ball, if you will, is um, sponsoring a bowl game. When I take a look at the, you know, all the bowl games that we've had in our history and all the different sponsors outside of the uh, Alamo Bowl down in San Antonio, which uh, Valero sponsored a few times. Uh, there hasn't been, you know, an oil and gas sponsor of a bowl game. But Kansas Strong sponsors um, touchdowns for teachers, which incorporates the Kansas uh, football team. And I got to tell you, it was fun this weekend when I was taking a look at scores and watching the Kansas Jayhawks kick the crap out of Iowa State. And every time I'm looking at the score, I get a smile to my face saying, you know what, there's some more money for the teachers. <laughs> it, it, it really adds a, a, a pleasant, positive way to enjoy football, but also fold in that oil and gas um, um, touch, if you will, that reach from the oil and gas industry. And that was kind of always my point, like, you know, if people are going to the Citrus Bowl and they have these great memories, imagine if it was the Exxon Mobile Citrus Bowl. Then they would walk out having all these, you know, Hail Mary uh, last second memories of the Exxon Bowl as opposed to, you know. Anyway, I, I think you understand my point, but talk to me a little bit, you know, about how the touchdown for teachers things, but um, I do think it does add a positive element to the whole deal and uh, incorporating football and 70,000 people coming together has a lot to do with it. 
Yeah, it's a it's a great venue for us. Uh, we sponsor every major university in the state of Kansas. Uh, we generally sponsor their sports related activities, whether it's football, basketball, or both. Uh, and and the reason we do that is because those audiences are a good cross section of the United States of America. You have basically every demographic. You have every social economic. Uh, demographic that is avail available in, in the country. It's a great cross-section of the United States, and it's hard to find venues that have such a good cross-section of the United States. So it's a good place for us to uh, be. And when we started looking at sponsorship in those, talking about sponsoring games, we looked at different ways of doing that, and one of the things we looked at was, do we take on a game? Do we take on a series? Do we take on a season? Um, and the problem with that is, is the oil and gas industry has somewhat of a reputation where when you do have, um, when you do have the uh, uh, sponsorship that's taken place, say the Valero Bow, um, a lot of people don't take that to account. Uh, kind of like the Chick-fil-A bowl. Uh, if you have the Chick-fil-A bowl, it's a little bit different because you're deciding where you're going to go eat lunch. And if you hear Chick-fil-A enough, you decide, okay, I'll go to Chick-fil-A. Uh, Valero is kind of not the same way. You don't hear Valero enough and say, you know what, I'm going to skip this gas station. I'm going to go to find, you know, find the next Valero. Uh, you just don't do that. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a different scenario. And then you got added to that the component that the people that we're really trying to reach are the ones who already consider oil to be big oil, uh, greedy, big oil, that all they do is take. All they do is take, take, take. And the reason they're sponsoring this bowl game is because they have so much money they don't know what to do with. Um, and so we tried to find a different way of doing that. We do that through, for, through Touchdown for Teachers, where we sponsor the University of Kansas. We sponsor both their football and their basketball programs. And through sponsoring them in the football program, we decided to put our money to work in a little bit different way where every time a field goal is kicked, a hundred dollars goes into, or excuse me, not field goal. Every time a touchdown is scored, a hundred dollars goes into a kitty that is set aside for teachers. And then we send out through social media and invite teachers all over the state of Kansas to sign up to be a part of a drawing at the end of the season. And however many uh, touchdowns the university of Kansas scores, we're going to give $100 per touchdown away, and we're going to give it all to one teacher to use in their classroom as they see fit, not giving it to their administration, not giving it to their school. We're giving it to the teacher to use in their classroom as they see fit to uh, move, pro, help move forward their education. And right now, I think we're at 38 touchdowns for the University of Kansas on the season. That's $3,800 that a teacher next year at least that a teacher next year is going to be able to utilize in their classroom in a meaningful way to do what they've always wanted to do in education. Last year, we gave away, I believe it was $5,600 to one teacher. And we it ended up, the drawing came out, and it was a shop teacher at Yates Center, Kansas. And for years, he's wanted to have for his shop project, them build a hovercraft that uh, they could, you know, demonstrate, take to events and put in competitions and stuff. And he wanted to build this hovercraft. Well, there's no funding in their school budget for him to do that. And so the $5,600 went to these kids that are out in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, uh, to build a hovercraft, go to competitions and compete with that hovercraft uh, moving forward. And so it's really a great way to connect with teachers, to open the dialogue, to all the other educational programs we offer, and also to show how uh, you know funding a teacher and a, funding the teachers themselves rather than the schools as a whole, but funding the teachers themselves can really push teachers to do extraordinary things. Anything happening news-wise with you guys? Anything new happening there? I was going to ask you about um, uh, upcoming series and if you want to do a review on that but uh before we get into uh landmen with billy bob thornton uh anything happening you know any any news happening that you uh you know well i think uh, i think the biggest thing for us is uh, this year we did a entire campaign campaign on energy and poverty 
and mm-hmm. we'll probably roll that into next year. I think that's going to be a continuing issue, especially I think over the next decade, that's going to be a major issue that the industry is really going to have to deal with and really going to have to, uh, the, the world is going to have to come to grips with how what we're doing energy policy wise, most of what's being decided at uh, governmental levels is being decided based on what's in the best interest of the environment. And the reality is, is what's in the worst interest of the environment is countries that are in poverty. You go to any country that is in poverty, and the first thing you're met with is an environmental disaster. Trash everywhere, smog everywhere, smoke everywhere. Uh, People just do not, when they do not have money, they do not have time, nor do they have concern to take care of the environment around them. And so the worst thing that can happen to the environment is that we have poverty increase around the world. And nothing drives poverty more than energy and access to that energy. Energy, by definition, is the ability to do work. What leads to poverty? The inability to do work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, energy and poverty, they go together in a very meaningful way. I've been amazed at how many people have responded to this campaign. Hmm. We've actually had nonprofit organizations that have called us up and have invited us to come and tour their facilities. I just toured one last week uh, where they saw our commercials on TV, and they're like, finally, someone is talking about this. The number one thing in the United States that people call for assistance with is help paying their energy bills or their utility bills. That's the number one thing they call for assistance with. And so it is a major issue for us going forward. And as long as inflation continues to grow, as long as our uh, energy prices are artificially inflated, it's going to become a greater and greater issue. And so newsworthy, I think, is the fact that um, that is really the future of our industry, is how does our industry impact those in the greatest need? Because we have the greatest ability to help them uh, anywhere in the world over any other energy source that is available. And so I think as that conversation begins to permeate our society, I think you can see that ship turn a little faster because people are going to begin to realize that energy and poverty is a major issue and the oil and gas industry is a central, pivotal uh, role in addressing it. One of the ways that uh, educates people is obviously through pop culture, educating people through um, affordable energy happens a lot of times through pop culture. Some of the imaging that's happened, whether it's through the Beverly Hillbillies to Giant to what was the uh, Marky Mark, uh, Mark Wahlberg um, Event Horizon movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so so anyway, public relations can come in the form of good, can come in the form of bad. I'm I'm very curious about the new Paramount Plus series that's going to be debuting on November 17th starring Billy Bob Thornton, Demi Moore, Andy Garcia, John Hamm. I mean, this has got the makings of a major uh, uh, series, much like Fargo, much like um, I'm trying to think Sopranos. I mean, that's that's where this is in the in the same level of. So I'd like to be able to do like a, a 10 part review series with you, if, if you wouldn't mind, when we can. You know, we'll do one series a day or uh, one series every three days, or we'll figure out the schedule. We'll print the schedule out on the Internet so people know ahead of time if they want to do a watch party and follow along, which a lot of people like to do. And uh, but I I don't know about you, Warren, but I can't do all 10 episodes in one night. I just can't. do. In fact, I think it's the first two come out the first week and then it's weekly after that. So we'll just do it every week. but uh, what's a landmine in the world yes. of oil and gas? Um, I think this is going to be interesting because a landman is a very basic um, role player, but a very instrumental uh, uh, um, position in the whole oil and gas process. Talk to me about, you know, your relationship with landmen, what you view a landman, describe them a little bit out there for the 
uh, listening audience who might not even be familiar with what a landman is. Yeah, I think it, uh, this series has me both on edge, uh, scared to death, and hopeful huh. all at the same time uh, because they they have centered in on a key ingredient that is often overlooked in the oil and gas industry, but an ingredient that has probably the biggest role in shaping people's view of the oil and gas industry. Uh, it's no secret that the oil and gas industry in the United States and vast portions of the United States revolves around the relationship between the oil producer and the landowner. That's where really the rubber meets the road and where conflict begins or conflict ends is in that relationship where you have two people that are sharing a property, hopefully for a common benefit to both parties, but that's where issues can really arise. And that's what this show is going to emphasize on. But what that means is, is that a landman is much like a real estate agent. And that real estate agent uh, that's going to show you the new house that you're going to buy, they take you through, they show you the whole house, they show you all the perks of the house, they you know uh, give you the best qualities of it. But unlike a real estate agent, when the landman goes in and they walk through the entire process, once you sign the contract, they don't walk away like a real estate agent does. The real estate agent walks away, they're done. The landman is there for the life of the lease. And really the landman, for in many regards, is the face of the industry to the public. That's the person in the company that negotiates and works with the people that are on the ground, that are on the public side of that interest. And so on the one hand, there are a lot of uh, the vast majority of landmen that are incredibly incredibly great individuals that are gifted, that have a desire to produce a win-win situation that's beneficial to all parties involved because they know that the longevity of their relationship is dependent upon that relationship. But we do have a few bad apples like in every other industry that's in it just for the money and they tend to go in and they inflate, they amplify, they lie, they do different things. So where this show goes is really going to be interesting to see on how much it is realistic and how much it, of it is taking from those negative stories uh, versus how much it's taking from those positive stories. But overall, uh, the oil and gas industry wouldn't be anywhere where it is today if the vast majority of those relationships weren't great, good relationships that benefited both parties. Most farmers and ranchers that are here in Kansas and across the Midwest are highly dependent upon the oil and gas industry to keep their uh, operations going through lean times and lean years. And so it is a win-win situation. But that landman position is really key because they really are the public face of the oil and gas industry to the public when it comes to putting money on the table. Uh, you know, And that's the most serious time. That's when you make the hardest feelings uh, uh, against you or the best feelings towards you is right there sitting at that kitchen table, and that's where that landman comes in. And so they negotiate the lease, they negotiate the operations, and then the oil company comes in and does the development, and the landman continues to develop that relationship through the entirety of that lease. So it is a crucial role, and it is a very significant and influential role that uh, you know we take very seriously in the industry. Uh, I regularly speak at um, landman association meetings where it's groups of landmen that are getting together and uh, that landmen can be both men and women, by the way, uh, but they get together and, you know, hone their skills and develop their skills and learn ethics and learn those different things. I regularly talk to those groups. I've recently just last month had an article published in Landman, the uh, national magazine uh, for their uh, association of workers that work in that part of our industry. And so, you know, I have a huge respect for landmen across the entire United States. And I believe that they are critical, critical to the image that the oil and gas industry has here in the United States with property owners. 
And so that's why I, I'm a, I have a little bit of fear about this series coming up. I have a little bit of hope about this series coming up. But my main goal is, is I hope it stays true to what's actually happening in the oil and gas industry, because what's happening in the oil and gas industry by far is beneficial to all parties involved and is a win-win for all parties involved with just a few exceptions. Well, I'm looking forward to it because, um, you know, you're kind of our expert. So we'll be able to decide or you'll be able to point out, yeah, that's actually something that's very common in the industry. OK, that happened once back in 1972. And now they're trying to make it seem like it's a normal because, you know, as well as I do Hollywood, they'll find one thing that happened one time. They'll sensationalize it. I am holding out a lot of hope, though, because Billy Bob Thornton has always been a uh, fan of the oil and gas industry. And it seems to me that uh, this is going to be more on the reality side, which I think will probably be good for the industry in the end, because um, I think a lot of people are OK with, you know, I come from agriculture. I mean, agriculture is one of the most dangerous industries forever. And it was it's just, you know, it's a net positive at the end of the day. And so as an agriculture community, we always kind of, you know, grew up around that type of a thing. And so I think a lot of people will will get that, too, with this, that I think this will be good for the industry. I do. I, I think it'll be good for the oil and gas industry. But we'll see. But I think you hit on the key point and where my, my slight little bit of fear comes through is uh, in the idea of sins of the father. Yep. And uh, sins of the father, you know, it's a, a legal term that has been utilized throughout history and where the children are uh, accountable for the sins of the father. Whatever the father did passes on to the kids and the grandkids and so on and so forth until they can repudiate themselves. And um, in what set America apart is America was truly set apart from the, we were one of the first countries in the world that absolutely rejected the idea of sins of the father, that each person was accountable for the work they did. They were accountable for what they did right, what they did wrong, and they had to answer for that. They did not have to answer for what their father did. It didn't matter what your father did. It matters what you did. And that's true in just about every arena of America, except the oil and gas industry. And the oil and gas industry is one of the few industries. I'm writing a paper on this right now called Sins of the Father. And the oil and gas industry is one of the few places where um, that old legal description is regularly used in courts and especially in the media where exactly what you're saying, you go back and you find a pipeline spill, you find a well that was a gusher that spilled water uh, here in Kansas. We have a situation right now where there are two homes that had oil in their water wells. Um, well, that oil dates back to over 100 years ago when the property owners, when they bought the property, they knew that oil was flooded into uh, open air tanks on the property because it was 100 years ago. They didn't know any better at that point in time. And yet they sued and the governor actually, or the, the Senate, House and Senate actually passed a bill that was going to pay them to buy their houses back because it had oil in the water, even though they knew that that was a potential and when they bought the houses. And fortunately, it was vetoed by the governor and was overturned. And uh, and they, they did not the, the state did not pay for their houses. But it was yet one more case where the sins of the father were being visited back onto the children and grandchildren of the industry uh, in today's world. We have come so far in the oil and gas industry. We have made such changes with ethics. We've made huge changes in environmental issues and how we address the environmental. We've made huge changes technologically in how we handle our resources and utilize them in the most environmentally conscious way possible. And the oil and gas industry that you have today cannot even begin to be compared with even the oil and gas industry that was in the 1990s, even the oil and gas, and especially the ones in the 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, and going back. And so, you know, I, I hope that you're right 
And I hope that they do not fall into the trap of the sins of the father and start looking back on all the things that have happened bad in the industry in the past and uh, place that on the fault and on the uh, shoulders of the current industry today, because we have come a long ways and America needs to understand that the oil and gas industry here in, in, in Kansas, the oil and gas industry here in America, we produce oil and natural gas in the most environmentally conscious way possible, and we do it better than any other country on earth. And the sins of our father do not change that. Getting very excited because not only are we going to have literally a 10-part series coming up on Landman, the reaction, but we're going to have to do at least a four-part series on that Sins of the Father's paper that you've got to. We're going to have to whole, do a whole new series. <laughs> uh, uh, like a, I don't know how many different chapters you got, but that sounds like a fantastic podcast series. I mean, totally serious. Yeah. Sins yeah. of the Father for oil and gas industry? Like that, that, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Like, uh, when are you done with that paper? Um, I'm working on it right now. I don't have a deadline. It's something I'm doing on the okay. side. That's kind of a spec job. And so it's, I've been not, kind of uh, on the side, but it should be finished up in the next couple of weeks. It's not for professor Johnson at the university of Kansas or anything like that. No, they, they probably wouldn't be interested in that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the few campuses I've been invited to speak there five times uh at the university of kansas and i've spoken there once uh the other four times i was canceled so oh. uh, uh, it's it's a little bit of a hard uh, place for me to get into but we it, we do what we can well uh, we appreciate the time today and look forward to what we got coming down the pipe and uh, what's the best place for people to find you best place to find us is at kansasstrong.com if you go to kansasstrong.com, you can find about jobs that are available here in Kansas. You can find about all of our campaigns, what we're doing. Go to our staff page and you can find connections to me and connect with me directly.